Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I should say at the beginning, if I look as I'm peering rather hard, I've got some new spectacles which I only picked up yesterday, so I'm not quite sure if I can read the screen here or the screen there. So apologies I look like a bit of a lost soul today. Um, please don't be put off by the geochemistry part of the title. For those of you who are non-geologists or non-geochemists, you're in good company. Um, and uh, I think uh, there's a lot we all still need to learn about the whole area. So let's... Um, Kick off. What's the clicker? Okay. Sorry. Okay, so let's start off and just look at the title a, a minute. Um, onshore, yes, but are there any offshore? Well, onshore, yes, we know that from the interior rift basins, but I'm going to take this morning offshore to refer to the coastal rift margin as a whole from the near shore and the onshore as well as the deep water. Um, I think it's important that we recognise that is all part of the same system, but there are reasons why it has not been fully explored and why we haven't seen the same successes there. So from the Amonex perspective, we've been there since 2002, looking mainly in Tanzania. We've tried to pick up information along the margin, but we've, as a small company, we've had to do a lot of our own field work using various data sources and literally getting oil on our boots by looking at seeps, well cuttings, the infamous tar balls and various geological outcrops to try and develop a regional understanding. And I'll be quite honest with you, a lot of this has been done to partly promote our own acreage, um, as well as trying to find the success for finding oil um, as, oppo as opposed to gas, if we're honest with ourselves. But the important thing to note is that geochemistry on its own won't help us find the oil, but only in combination with the right exploration methods will it increase the chance of finding oil rather than gas. So, 2002, when we first came there, East Africa was very underexplored. It had been left behind for a long time. Um, although it had been explored since the early 50s, um, most, and most of the early wells did have shows of oil and or gas, but, there, but it just lacked behind. It was limited infrastructure, corporate and global politics, world oil prices, and, yes, personal career ambition uh, in the various majors that were exploring at the time, all conspired keep Africa in the backwater and make everyone go for the big, easy oil elsewhere. So until the early 1990s, it was largely the work of BP Shell, Ajif Amico and Texaco who had done the work there. And um, I, I think it's fair to say that apart from Ajip now in the form of ENI, none of those other companies are really that big yet in East Africa, in the Kenya, Tanzania, Mozambique region. But onshore, there have been some successes and in the near shore. We've had in the um, northern area, sorry, I'm using the pointer. In the northern area here, we've had Song, Songo Songo. Um, sorry, I'm not even looking up. Uh, sorry, in the, um, yeah, we've had Songo Songo, um, the Mukaranga discovery up here by Moran Prom, PetroQuest, and Kilawani North, small uh, gas discovery in recent, relatively recent years. Songo Songo was the first discovery back in 1974 of Ajipamico. And then the Ravuma Basin onshore and near shore, we've had Manazi Bay, which was discovered back in 1980 by um, Ajip, oh, sorry, 82, and the recent Entori discovery by Amonex last year, spudded in 2011 and um, came in in February and tested in June last year. So these, all these onshore and near shore discoveries have had condensate in various quantities. Um, and basically a lot wetter gas than the dry gas found in the deep water offshore. And so um, we've used these samples to try and get a better handle on the geochemistry and the overall potential for the oil. So deep water exploration success does act as a pointer to what might be found in the near shore or the onshore. It's a, in the gross scale of things, it's a fairly simple geological model. You've got the Progradation of the East African shoreline, particularly in the region of the delta, such as the Fiji and obviously the Ravuma Delta, where you've got um, the basin floor fan systems, all the big discoveries, basically have their stratigraphically lateral counterpart up on the shelf or the, on the marine shelf or the onshore. And recent improvements in seismic imaging and acquisition methodology confirm the presence of such traps and their as yet unexploited potential. The only problem is. They've hardly been drilled yet. And we'll come on to this after we start to talk about the geochemistry. But 
the geology of the whole region of the East African continent of Martin is determined by two key events. That's the uplift and eastwards tilt of the margin associated with the East African rift system and the formation of the modern delta system, such as the Lamu, Rufiji, and Ruma deltas. And you can see in the examples at the bottom here, two examples. There you've got um, Songo Songo um, coming from the Uni Lysis block, which is a, 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 a massive um, uplift inversion feature. And then in the offshore here, you've got the Carimbus Graben, which sits um, somewhere out, out here. So you've got some quite interesting geology in the region. What, what can we do about it for the geochemistry in terms of source kitchen um, prediction and migration and maturation? The two rift phases are quite evident on here. We've got the, um, initial, uh, the initial rift phase in the Permo Trias and the Karoo, where we've got um, rich locally light oil and gas prone source rocks. And then we've got the um, second rift phase here with the breakup of Gondwana land when Madagascar and India split away from Africa uh, around, around about the, uh, between the lower and the base middle, upper, uh, base middle Jurassic. And uh, those, those really, at the moment, are what we believe to be the two main oil-prone source intervals. Um, the younger tertiary up here, we've got no major rifting, and as yet, we've got no major sources. Now, there is a lot of potential, well, there is some potential for sources in the, in the tertiary, but at the moment, there's not much hard evidence that's been published, and we'll address that shortly. Looking at the, the hard facts for the oil story, this is something from a paper I did with Chris Matchett Downs, um, who's now at Adamantine, um, some years ago when he was with Jebco. We, and uh, we looked at all the seeps, the known seeps at the time, primarily from Tanzania, but also Kenya, and a bit of Mozambique. Um, obviously, we had more access to Tanzania than the others. But as you can see, Many of these wells there, from the 50s through to the 80s, all had shows of oil and gas. Mafia Island, that was the first well drilled by BP in, uh, I think, 1954 or 1956, Mafia 1. And that TD'd um, in the Upper Cretaceous with oil shows. But of course, going back to, I say, personal career ambition, for, for example, not being a great incentive to exploration here, um, if you're going up the corporate ladder in BP in the 1950s and you've had a fantastic well in Mafia Island in Tanzania, where there's no, inf going back to the last talk, there's no infrastructure um, and it's only a sniff of oil and a sniff of gas, compared to um, your colleagues and your peer group who are all out in the Middle East bringing in wells in what was then Persia at 25,000 barrels a day and getting nice bonuses and getting up the greasy pole of success, then there's not much incentive to stay looking in places like East Africa. And of course, when you become the big boss and you're young, bright, spark says to you, please, sir, we should go and explore in East Africa again, you're not going to give them much incentive to do so. So despite all these shows, a lo a lot, it showed there was something going on there, but it didn't lead to any major exploration until the last 10 years, perhaps. And that's some of the physical evidence again. And these are, these are all samples uh, that I've been involved with, associated with. Major gas seeps on the Manazi Bay Peninsula. It's like a city in a hot tub at low tide. You've got the kill on the soak oil seep on the coast. Fresh oil coming up in, um, between the high tide and low tide mark on the foreshore. Fresh seeps. Oil sands. Um, a newly found oil seep to the west of our Ravuma license last year. In actual fact, it was a condensate, but that um, we, we gathered there. Um, on the geological maps, that outcrop is shown as being granitic basement. So quite how the oil seep was there, I don't know. But um, there's a lot more work to be done in that region, which I'll point to the location next. And of course, tarballs from the foreshore of Muni and Akusa Islands. And of course, as well, fresh condensate samples from the Entoria 1 gas discovery that we made last year. So looking at the tarballs, starting to hit the geochemistry now. Um, <coughs> We had, we've picked up tar balls from various places on the coastline, Akusa Island, Zanzibar, and Newley Island, and it wasn't particularly difficult to look for these. I mean, some of these tar balls are more like tar mats on the foreshore, and they're the size of a, a dinner table. I mean, it's a lot, there's a lot of oil there, but you know, the obvious question was, is it tanker washes, et cetera? Well, we looked for the um, biomarkers um, and threw a lot of effort at it, and we found they all matched. Um, they were all the same families. 
The interesting one, though, was from Latham Island. Um, Latham Island, I stopped off on the way back from down south by boat, and it's an island about 40, 50 kilometres off the coast of um, Tanzania, um, about 50 kilometres uh, due east of uh, Dar es Salaam, and found some oil uh, tar balls that had come in on that morning's tide. They were very <coughs> fresh, wet and sticky. There were no tanker movements in the area at that period. And uh, interestingly, we had traces of oleonane in this tar ball, which is normally taken as a tertiary biomarker. Um, in fact, oleonanes are much older than the tertiary, but um, uh, there's another, we'll touch on that later. But at the moment, that tar ball from Latham Island is the only direct evidence I've seen, uh, or public, anything like published data, for a tertiary source presence in the region. <coughs> Songo Songo gas field from 1974 was the first major discovery, but that has minor amounts of condensate associated with the gas, despite misreporting the early well histories of oil, sometimes described as white oil, sometimes described as light oil. It was, in fact, a condensate. It, it produ Songo Songo produces about a barrel of condensate for every million cubic feet of gas. It, it is fairly dry, but nonetheless, it's there. And if, if anything, it's a problem rather than a, a benefit because it's in such small quantities, it's... Um, it's basically, given, as far as I'm aware, it's given away to TPDC who collect it sort of twice a month. Well, uh, it's more or less get rid of it. But Dan Jarvi of Humboldt um, did some work on this, and he found that the condensate um, was, uh, the, the ratio of toluene methyl cyclohexane ratio was typical of terrestrial sourced oils, but the inferred lithophas is just a marine source. And he, he believes this indicates a fractionation, a, a fractionated condensate from a deeper oil system. So we've done work on the condensate associated with the gas at Songo Songo, our gas discovery down there at Kilowani North and also at Entoria. And we have um, the same story that the, the condensate and the proportion of the gas is likely derived from fractionation of oils rather than simply a mature gas-prone source rock. So there really is an oil-prone source rock out there. Where is it? What's happened to it? Well, it's still a teaser to a large extent. When we drilled our UD1 well back in 2003-2004, uh, at one point we had a, a film of um, oil on the surface of one of the mud pits. But um, we've d we looked at the biomarkers and we found that, hey, guess what? We had exactly the same ratios um, to the tar balls washed ashore on the <coughs> island. So that suggests there's some pretty major seeps in the region. Um, the C17 pristine ratio is indicative of mature oil as was the C20 to C23 slit. In case you can't see it, that's an analysis of the oil from the subsurface from cuttings. That's an analysis of the oil for the tar ball sample on the shoreline of the island. So we're getting some pretty good matches. Um, the biomarker maturity ratio suggests that the source for the oil was at a greater depth than that of the cuttings from which it was recovered, which means basically the oil had migrated. The Further analysis of the biomarkers indicate they were sourced from a lower to middle Jurassic carbonate-influenced marine source rock, uh, as well as the fact that any recoverable oil um, from the Neocomian reservoirs in the area of Songo Song would likely be a nice oil of in the range of 35 API, so quite a nice target to go for. Um, we went back and looked at cuttings from other wells at the time. We looked at the upper Jurassic cuttings from the Songo Songo 1 discovery well, that was drilled in 1974, and um, lo and behold, they had fluorescence in some of the cuttings. So we took these out, and we looked at the oil extracts, and yep, they were the same as the ones from Uni, which is about 20 kilometers away. Um, same source rock. We then did a comparison, and you can see here, we've got the um, comparison from various uh, Muni subsurface samples to the Songo Songo Upper Jurassic extract, about 4,000 meters. Over here, we've got a comparison of the Muni oil well shows with um, tar balls from the Kuza and Nayuni Islands. These are all small islands offshore, as well as a comparison to cuttings for, through the lower Jurassic from the Mbati well in the Mandawa Basin, where, you, where it penetrates lower Jurassic source rocks. So there's your match. When I say lower Jurassic, I, I should say lower stroke basal middle Jurassic breakup restricted environment time. So we're getting a pretty good story here, we believe. Um, 
but we still haven't got the oil. We're still getting gas everywhere. Um, if we look at the vitronite reflectance data from the Uni-1 well, um, they, they indicate the cuttings that we analyzed were still early mature for oil generation. But of course, we didn't have any suitable kerogens in. The only ones we had were about 90% of type 3 and type 4, um, no type 1 and type 2. So that basically means the shale cuttings have no potential for oil generation from at least the, um, the, the upper Jurassic and the Cretaceous that we penetrated, even though they are in the depth window. So what it's saying is that the, the oil shows were generated from elsewhere at greater, greater depths of maturity. No oil source potential was observed throughout the Cretaceous or upper Jurassic. So um, what can be seen is that if we look at the maturity analyses from the various wells in uh, Songo, Songo, as well as, uh, as, well as Uni, um, there, there is an apparent potential onset of generation at a shallow depth at Uni 1, but this is primarily due to the uplift at Songo Songo, which um, effectively implies a higher maturity gradient than is the case. The gas chromatographs of the condensates from around the area are also slightly different composition between um, Songo Songo and our Kiliwani North well, which is literally about two kilometres away from Songo Songo. Kiliwani North, the small gas discovery, it's about, um, get the numbers right, I think it's, it's 45, 45, 55 um, BCF P mean recoverable, but then, you know, we're two kilometres away from the gas processing plant on the Songo Songo line, so it's quite a nice little pipeline prospect. But the Kilawali North condensate contains more gasoline hydrocarbons <coughs> in the C5 to C7 range than from Songo Songo. So there, it, 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 there's a Songo Songo sample show a much higher range of alkanes up to C30. Um, so it suggests that there is some oil component in solution in the condensate. If we look at the GCMS samples from Mbati 1, which is the um, one at the top here, and compare to the uni one cuttings and the recent Entoria condensate, um, they've all got very similar biomarkers. Uh, they contain features of hydrocarbons sourced from uh, carbonate rocks. Maturities vary, of course, across the region, because I mean, Entoria is down in the south near the Mozambique Basin, whereas Uni and, and, um, uh, is up by Songa Songa, about 250 kilometers north. But they are mainly main to late oil window. Um, Again, it all supports, it's all supported as well from the biomarkers, the uh, lower to mid Jurassic. So, nearly all the seeps and shows have these similar indications. Um, the important thing is that the formations from which the cuttings were obtained did not have hydrocarbon source potential within them themselves, and they're also thermally immature for hydrocarbon generation. So, I think we can establish beyond doubt the oil, um, sampled oil shows were migrated. I'm sorry, this slide hasn't come out as it was meant to be for some reason. Um, the top corner there is supposed to show the published graphic of Anadarko's ironclad discovery showing the oil. So um, obviously they want to keep it secret still despite publishing it. But we have down here the, um, the display of their um, oil analysis, um, uh, which shows uh, a, a low resolution GC image of the oil extractor of ironclad. I think they, penetrated a 28 meter oil column in tight sands as described as, but there was no information published as to the likely source rock for the oil or the state of that oil. Um, all we can say is this, is this is just a blur that we've scanned from what they published up here. Um, the, the, the published figure appears to show degradation of that oil due to the presence of a, what's known as to the geochemist as UCM, or unresolved complex material hump, which is this big lump down here. Um, basically, from the seismic section they published, which is a simple update stratigraphic pinch out, there's no obvious um, reason for the, on the seismic for that oil to be uh, biodegrade, biodegraded, for example, as it is here. So something is, has happened to that oil. Um, we need to find out what. Going back to that vitronite curve, um, it's clear that whilst we haven't penetrated that lower base middle Jurassic source in the wells offshore in this region. It is clear though, if you look at the various gradients, the spread, if we've got wells, oh, sorry, a potential Jurassic source rock below wells on the fall of this gradient here, they could still be um, within the oil window. 
whereas up here on this gradient, they're much more mature. So there's different amounts of uplift of maturity in the region based on what we're getting from vitronite data in the wells. So um, on average, we've got about 800 meters of uplift at Songo Songo, which is quite a bit of inversion. And so we're getting a story that starts to fit together here as to why there's gas there rather than oil so far. Um, just going back to the two main rift phases for the deposition of source rocks, this is a, a, a plot of the ion geophysics line, which goes way offshore into the ocean. Um, it's quite a few, it's about two or 300 kilometers. Um, but offshore, you've got the Krimbus Graben here. And you can see that um, you've got Hermo Trias down here. If there's a source rock down here, there's going to be quite a substantial uh, kitchen, as well as uh, a lot of potential in this deep area out here for the low middle Jurassic. The Permo Trias, though, is lacustrine. Um, light waxy oils and prolific gas, whereas the lurd basal mid-Jurassic is oil prone. Um, so we've got a bit of a mix in source rocks here, which is not great for the story. The problem here is, though, there's not much evidence, there's not many well penetrations this part of East Africa to the permo source rock section, except for one well, Lucalady 1. This is the well just in the, uh, up here in the, in the uh, Tanzanian part of the onshore of Luma Basin. Fortunately, it sits on our P PSA, which is why I got some information on it. It was a well drilled by Texaco in 1990 uh, to a total depth of 1,941 metres uh, TD, where it TD'd in crystalline basement. It was drilled as part of an aid programme and um, apparently for biostratigraphic research primarily, but it wasn't drilled on a target. Um, it penetrated an almost complete Lur Cretaceous and Late Jurassic section at about 500 metres of, of Karoo. And unfortunately, all the cores were destroyed, or rather lost, in storage. But as you can see, that's the well. We have a full check shot survey for it, and it shows TD here. But actually, it TD'd within, uh, within crystalline basement. The problem is that the well is one and a half kilometres from the nearest seismic line. So it's unfortunately, it's a pretty useless well for our correlation to the seismic because you can see from the site, this might not be the best line, you see quite clear here. There's the basement, there's your Karoo sub-basins, and there's a TD of the well, which on the actual well section it would be down there. So we have a correlation problem, which doesn't help us tremendously. But it did tap a rich Permian source rock. Um, the section in the Permian was immature, but it's likely to be oil mature and primary gas mature immediately off structure in the surrounding sub-basins. So we can say that by extrapolation, the Permian is going to be peaked post-maturity and the Graben's developed offshore as well. Now, that's not so good because we got a, um, we recorded gas bubbling from the core sample uh, that was covered at surface. Um, the Ge the geochemical analysis was done back in 1980 uh, 82 by Amoco and um, ECL. Basically, um, it's going to give light, light waxy oil, but prolific amounts of gas, very prolific amounts of gas. It is essentially a, a gas prone source rock. Um, so we've got two major source rocks one's potentially oil, one's potentially gas. Um, we can separate the two families out. I, on this chart here, I take, we've got examples from the Permian Madagascar oils, your Bamalanga, um, Simororo, and Sakamina sources down here. And up here on the sofa plot, we've got the lower middle Jurassic sources from not just Tanzania, but also the West Kirindi well in the uh, Mondava <coughs> basin of Madagascar. And there are two distinct families around. So, as you, as you can probably imagine now, we're getting a bit of a problem here because we've got a deeper gas-prone source rock underlying a really nice oil-prone source rock. That's going to start confusing the story. Um, the gasoline plot here, the ratios of the methocyclohexane to toluene from these various condensate samples also demonstrates the evidence for fractionation. Um, it, we've got different levels of maturity present. and In fact, we've done the, um, the carbon isotope methane ethane analyses we've done on our gas from Kilowani North, for example, which is next order Songo Songo. Um, we've got variable maturities, and it's really the best evidence we've got to say that a lot of the gas in Kilowani North, and, and therefore by implication Songo Songo, because they're, they're about two kilometres apart, is essentially a mixture of Permian derived gas and lower 
base middle Jurassic derived gas, which is probably also where a lot of the condensate comes from as well in terms of source rock age. So we've got a mixing of source rocks. Uh, uh, sorry, a mixture of mixing of migrated hydrocarbons. <coughs> um, the We've got a, we believe we've got inversion giving rise to increased maturity and flashing of the oils to the gas and condensate phase from the Jurassic fluids, and that's going to give you flushing, uh, um, effectively uh, flushing, and give, produce gas with minor amounts of condensate. But that is underlain by the post mature permatriasic source rocks, which are going to be gas mature. Um, you've got a real problem here of permatrias gas flushing a base middle Jurassic generated oil at the same time as that oil is being flashed to a gas condensate phase as a result of the structure inversion. So it's getting fairly complex. Um, <laughs> I can feel the non-geologists and non-geochemists falling asleep here, so I'll speed up this bit. But essentially, um, as inversion proceeds, as shown on the graph here, so heat flow increases and the pressure in the system drops which results in generation of gas under the lower pressure conditions. Now, my colleague Andy Carr isn't here to explain this in terms of thermodynamics. He would love to, but um, I think we'll save him in reserve for, for next time. Um, but look at the regional prospectivity now. The, the Entoro discovery, along with many of the leads identified with the, within the Revuma PSA, for example, is essentially part of the same player fairway as the recent deep water discoveries. You can see here, take the water bottom. Here we've got e &I with a massive basin floor fans out here, a bit shallow up Adadarko, BG and Statol's deep water discoveries. Some pretty big numbers up here. Manazi Bay sits on the shoreline effectively, but it's, it's in a diff slightly different part of the overall system. Um, and then we've got Entoria back where we've got the, the um, uh, slope complexes coming shallow. So we've had uplift to the uh, west here, the South East African Rift. So all this shallower section has been eroded away, has been lost. That's probably where the later sands out here have come from. But essentially, we're in as we go further towards the rift margin, we're in touch with the older stratigraphy. Um, the play fairway in terms of reservoirs ranges from, so far, range from mid-Cretaceous at Victoria <coughs> to Liga Miocene uh, up here at uh, Manazi Bay. Now, this is just a cartoon sketch, but it illustrates in simple terms. Um, as we go on shore as well, we're increasingly Li likely to be increasingly liable on um, the updip, re re dependent actually on the updip pinch out for trapping and sealing ability compared to the more deep water basinal prospects where quite often there's a, a structural element involved as well as a result of um, <coughs> drape compaction effects and so forth. As, as for source rocks, the other two types we've promoted in the past are the um, upper Cretaceous and the only evidence, potential evidence of this is from the Kimbiji main one well drilled in 1980 offshore Tanzania. Um, there was a supposed enough Cretaceous source rock penetrated there, but it's the only well that records this potential. It seems to be one core plug sample of about 12%, which looks, when you look at the, the original report, as it could be 1.2%, but just a poor quality photocopy. And that's out of about 10 or 11 core plugs taken over the shale interval. All the other core plugs had TOCs of less than 1%. So it's not really looking like a major regional source rock. We've certainly not seen it in other wells. Um, as for the tertiary, well, there's anecdotal evidence about the tertiary. I've seen the earlier name uh, we've had, but could that be scavenged from uh, condensates or, or what have you, migrating through a tertiary uh, immature section, but with only names present in the organic matter? Um, it's a bit of a debatable question. The geochemists like to argue that. But essentially, we've got two, the two regional sources. Um, there's also anecdotal support for a biogenic source for much of the gas. But I think, um, uh, um, was it BG or was it Anna Dark, I think, I forget now, said that they had thermal, thermogenic gas, not biogenic. And I've seen nothing published to support th uh, biogenic gas. The inversion tectonism has influenced the, the sedimentology and reservoir distribution as well as the thermal maturity. And I think it's important that all the significant discoveries on and offshore are primarily stratigraphic and not structural, when the early exploration effort, eff efforts were all focused on structural prospectivity. But um, Songo Songo in 1974 was a, stru a structural discovery, 
um, on the near Comin, and that's influenced many of us for a number of years looking for similar structural plays on shore. The stratigraphic complexity has been very hard to image and interpret with confidence because the absence of well data and much of the legacy seismic data has been acquired for big structural prospects. Um, poor quality of data, limited data, and frankly, lack of large structures has not helped. And it's certainly not helped the accuracy of where you locate your wells. The recent deep water exploration by comparison has been very successful, albeit for gas rather than oil so far, because the ease of acquiring state-of-the-art 2D and 3D seismic in an unrestricted open marine environment um, with long offsets, multiple streams, etc. And of course, advanced processing and imaging techniques um, does help to de-risk the prospects pre-drilling quite significantly. But we just can't use similar acquisition and processing methodologies in the onshore and nearshore environments. Um, more modern 2D seismic can approach, can start doing this, but <coughs> prospects defined by more modern techniques are still large, and this applies not just to Tanzania but elsewhere along the margin. Um, prospects defined by more modern acquisition and processing techniques on those nearshore and onshore environments are still largely untested through drilling. Um, and in fact, this is reflected in the current activity report in the uh, monthly maps that come out from Drilling Info. As you can see here, all the little seismic boats in the offshore environment around northern Mozambique and Tanzania for surveys in progress or planned or finished. And you go to the onshore or the nearshore, and there's virtually nothing. And that just shows how all the seismic effort is going into those offshore environments, deep water. And so we're running away with the game here, but onshore and nearshore, very little is happening. Um, so it's a very different level of activity there. And here's why. Here's an example from our uni PSA. This is the Admiralty map, and I've zoomed in on this little bit here. And you can see the area in blue is less than 10 metres water depth. The areas in green are reefs. Many of these reefs you can walk across at low tide. Maybe you get your ankles wet, but that's it. The shelf edges along here, everything to the west of that shelf edge is less than about 40 metres. You do not get many seismic boats that want to go in there with, say, 10 parallel streams, 8 kilometres long. They just don't want to go into that environment when there's reefs. And these are the charted reefs. They don't want to go in that environment. So there's only two ways of it. OBC transition zone data, which is expensive because there's not many crews around. It's expensive. It's time-consuming to get a detailed grid. Or you have a separate source boat to a streamer boat, etc. Well, there's not many contractors around. You've got to mobilise them. There's not much follow-on work. So they don't, rather like these supermodels, they don't get out of bed for less than 10 grand a day or whatever. Same with the seismic contractors. And though, those reefs are the chartered ones. And that admiralty chart, the bulk of this area here, was done by the Royal Navy in 1875 to 1877. And that's as good as it gets. You can play around with Landsat and other satellite data, but it's not going to give you the resolution needed if you seismic survey in confidence. So much of that legacy data was acquired with single uh, streamers uh, with an offset of 1,500 metres or less. In 2005, we acquired stuff with a 3,000 metre offset, um, and with careful processing, the longer offsets actually do show a significant improvement in the seismic imaging to de-risk, but we haven't got around to drilling those yet. That's an example. This is a line here, as came out, um, with the just processing the longer offsets from that 2005 data, and suddenly you see prograding clinoforms, you see very clear potential for a mid-Cretaceous fan system and this is on the shelf in only about 40 metres of water. Of course, your next problem then is drilling it. You need a jack-up rig. There's not many other areas in East Africa right now where jack-ups are required. In fact, the last one was in 1992 for Shell. So it's a very difficult area to explore. And it's quite easy to argue that the high failure rate of past wells in the onshore and shallow marine settings <coughs> is due primarily to lack of quality seismic to properly image structure, uh, uh, let alone stratigraphy, and de-risk the prospects prior to drilling, whether or not you're looking for oil or gas. So large areas have not been explored. Of course, that means that many of the wells that have been drilled have been drilled on poor data. They weren't even a valid test if there was oil there. So here's another example. This is in our review of PSA. This is our Kiswa lead, which is offshore. It's a base tertiary channel system. We've got a Kiswa 1 there and a Kiswa 2 lead here. Just flipped it around to look the right, same way around as BG's Jodari um, Discovery, which is about four and a half to six TCF of gas. These are only about 25, 20 kilometres apart from each other, analogous. But that's what you get with 3D, 
And this is what you get with 2D, albeit 5,000 meter <coughs> offset data from that 2005 server we did in the region. It's good data, but we've got a very sparse 2D grid there compared to 3D here. Um, onshore, that lead, Kiswa 2, becomes a sooty lead in the onshore area of our acreage. Again, very much like Jodari. And again, similar morphology, this wonderful lead here from impact on the Tugela Cone offshore Durban in East Africa. This is their Leviathan prospect, which is at uh, mid Cretaceous. But they, again, they've got the advantage of high quality 2D or 3D, I forget which now. But the imaging is so much better. This degrades that one line on shore. The next parallel seismic line to that is about three or four kilometers away. A lot of people get scared by that. And if we go back, that Sudi lead that you've just seen, this feature here, was originally imaged by Texaco in 1990 as a large structural lead here. You can see the coastline here. Our lead is about here now. But Texaco imaged a large four-way dip-closed anticline because they were working on data of that quality. That is a quality of legacy onshore data. Well, you know, it's hard enough to find a structure on there that you can map, let alone a stratigraphic feature. So there's a lot of work and potential still to be done at onshore environment. And I think finishing up now, um, if we look at the continual, if we look at this sort of schematic dip profile, this is in the sort of Ravuma region here of East Africa, um, we've had effectively continuous barrel of the Permian and lower base middle Jurassic source successions uh, until the beginning of the Pliocene when we had uplift and inversion, which accompanied by faulting. That gave us the sudden release of deeply buried um, and now overpressured hydrocarbons into the shallow section. So we've got the gas prone permatrice, which is mature. We've then got the oil prone lower base middle Jurassic, which has then been uplifted and been flashed to the gas condensate fraction. So we've got a lot of gas slopping around the area. Um, an, incru an incredible volume of Pliocene release gas, which is going to reduce the chances of finding big oil in the, in the, in the near shore and onshore, as well as the deep water in many areas. Um, so both phase of hydrocarbons were effectively released simultaneously and any oils that were already produced will tend to have been flushed out of traps by that immense volume of gas. So where will that flashing go? Well, we've got a lot of oil at the surface of seeps, um, but we consider the best chance, myself and my colleagues, consider the best chances of finding oil as opposed to gas, and this is the um, moment you've been waiting for, I guess, for tea. Um, any chance of finding oil as opposed to gas will relate to older source kitchen release events when the Jurassic interval was that base middle Jurassic was still within the oil window, perhaps protected early traps associated with the coastal hinge line may be the most prospective um, because that's where we find most of the oil seeps. But there may, but more importantly, I think, and more likely, there may be depot center flank regions in the deeper offshore waters to the east where the Jurassic interval has remained in the oil window during the Pliocene tectonism. <coughs> Um, heat flows following rifting may have affected this. But also to the west, we have a chance on the margins, although it gets very shallow, it's long migration pathways, etc. To the west, which is really looking at the near shore and onshore and specific regions, we have a better chance for finding oil rather than gas. But as I've tried to show you, those areas are desperately underexplored by drilling and seismic. So it could be there, but we haven't actually given it a fair test yet. The geochemical evidence from the oils and seeps shows that significant volumes should have been generated, at least from the region we're looking at here, from northern Mozambique to southern Kenya. Most evidence pointed towards the lower to basal middle Jurassic for the oil source, but as we've seen, those oils will have been expelled westwards and possibly eastwards by flashing and flushing. There's good evidence for significant Permian gas generation, but that evidence as far as from our perspective, only consists of the Luca Lady stratigraphic well, uh, stratigraphic research well, and the um, carbon isotope analyses of the gases from Songo Song and Kiliwani North. So, what we what we need really to help us is better seismic onshore and the shallow marine to de-risk our exploration targets, so we can except that many of the wells drilled in the initial 40 years or so were not valid tests. They weren't even on a, on a bona fide trap. 
Um, but also, we need more favourable exploration licensing regimes from some of the governments who are starting to toughen up a bit at the moment to maintain rather than stifle the churnover of exploration licences by the smaller and uh, the smaller companies that tend to be more innovative but less well funded. Um, and I use examples, I mean the Kenyans are starting to talk about increasing the uh, entry requirements for submitting for a licence, 100 million in assets and um, uh, I, I, I think there are um, some fairly substantial work programmes. Uh, the um, Comoros people are talking about similar way over the top entry barriers which is just going to stop the smaller companies coming in. And if you look in the past, it's all the smaller companies that have been more innovative uh, until the majors swoop in when everything's been sufficiently de-risked. So we've got to encourage the smaller companies to keep pressing on. But also we need increasing contractor availability and competition to help. Um, but at the end of the day, it's only the increase in access to published data from all the companies out there that's going to really help us. Um, and in fact, in October, we had a talk here, and Hannah Dark and I were here, and they basically refused to answer questions on the geochemistry, partly, I think, because they didn't actually know themselves. Um, so finally, I'd like to say, you know, there is a good chance of oil out there, but we've got to be very specific in the areas. For my money, I've got two areas I like the idea I like in Tanzania. Unfortunately, they're both licensed to other companies. But I think there is a chance, but I think we're going to be better off looking at the near shore and the onshore than in the deep water. So if you're in the deep water, sorry guys, I think it's going to be gas for the time being. I hope I'm proven wrong, but um, I hope that gives you an idea that there should be oil out there, but um, there's a long way to go yet. Thanks for listening. Tea time. Thank you. Okay, well... Time for a couple of questions. We're running a little late, but not dreadfully. So, any, any, Bob. In the um, first well that you drilled, the Likondi well. Likondi in the Rivuma PSA. Yes, yes, in the Rivuma. Am I right in saying that that was concluded to have been a breached trap, and that there was residue of oil um, above the um, the Karoo, which may have been high pressure somewhere down at depth? Yeah. Um, it wasn't a breach. Tra um, it wasn't a breach trap. The primary target was basal tertiary sands, and there was actually no structure. We had a statics problem on the seismic because we had a fairly coarse seismic grid. Although we shot new seismic um, in about 2000, onshore seismic 2007, um, it was largely a grid infill based on the work by previous operators. Because what we have to remember is that until 2010, everyone was, all the previous wells had been drilled on structural prospects. The seismic wasn't available in the onshore and nearshore to image stratigraphic features. And in fact, the first discovery offshore in the deep water wasn't until about 2010 11. So um, in 2007, we planned the area when there's very little activity. I think the first deep water seismic was only you know, proprietary seismic, we were just starting. We'd based our seismic grid on the previous work by, on the work by previous operators and would focus along the hinge line infilling the grid, looking for def better definition of some of the structural traps as that Texaco one I showed you. But a lot of the legacy seismic was missing st uh, static information, um, so we had a fairly coarse data set. Um, it was only post-well when we had some velocities to tie the information down that we started to find um, what was going on. But also, limited well data. We had um, a lot of our tops in the Leconde one came in over 400 metres deep to prognosis because we had a shallow high velocity carbonate interval, which wasn't available, in the, which wasn't penetrating the Lucalady stratigraphic well and not present in Manazi Bay. It was very much a wildcat well. Um, in term, there were oil shows in the um, mid Cretaceous and upper Jurassic in Liconde. Um, we, it could have been a, a, a breach trap or, it, um, or the result of uh, residues from flashing, but we didn't, we um, didn't have very good seismic definition at that lower level. So, still a bit of an unknown there. But it doesn't contradict no. the model so far. It does kind of confirm the presence of oil in some kind of system though, doesn't it? Yes, absolutely. And the Luca Lady well, um, it does show there's a hydrocarbon source for an albeit primarily gas pro. What we don't know is the section through the thicker part of those permotrias sub-basins. There's no penetrations out there. But significantly, all the oil seeps we've analysed have all shown in the lower to basal middle of Jurassic, so we haven't picked up a, a permotrias oil seep yet. Okay. One, one more. Uh, 
Duncan McGregor, sure, Steve. Um, just a little bit of a challenge on the Permian. Right. Uh, you've got one well here. Yeah. Um, which has got undoubtedly gas flow and source rocks, but you're ob obviously in the conjugate of uh, Madagascar, where you've got several yes. occurrences of uh, uh, oil prone Sacamina source rocks. So, right. Um, <laughs> obviously, it's in gas window anyway, but yeah. uh, just d dismissing it as gas flow and perhaps is pushing it too oh, far. Oh, no, I, I, I don't want to dismiss it. I don't mis sorry, don't misunderstand me. Um, I mean, I showed you the cross section. I, um, I showed you the cross section. I Probably not time to go back to it, but that the, the Luke Lady well was not drilled on a seismic line. It was not drilled on a prospect. It was um, a sort of research project that Texaco were funding at the time, and it was primarily drilled for biostratigraphic research. Apparently, um, they drilled the well 25 meters from the nearest asphalt road on a slight high mound. It wasn't going to get flooded in the wet season. It was a well of convenience, um, which is very frustrating because not only that, we can't tie it to the section, so we have no idea of knowing what that main uh, Permatrias graben is filled with, and it could well have um, oil-prone source rocks in it. We we don't know if the section we penetrated where it, where it sits at the base of that <coughs> basin or the top, just below the breakup conformity. What I would say though is that there's more work to be done there. You know, if, if anyone's got the money to sponsor a few PhD students doing field work, that'll be tremendous because, frankly. As I showed with that condensate seep that we found last year, it was in an area that's on the geological maps as being on granite basement. It's not supposed to be there. So clearly there's some, a lot of inaccuracies in the field mapping, which hasn't really been done in detail since Bob Stoney did it in the 1950s. It's only been marginally, oh, I think, I, should, I don't want to be disrespectful, but I mean, the current day maps haven't changed much. And the location of that is really, it's between where the hard rock geologists are exploring and where the soft rock people like ourselves are exploring. So it's a, it's a barrier zone there. And that's where the Pomo Trias might be um, close to the surface, but what's actually down there, I don't know. Um, there, there may be more oil seeps around that haven't been recognized yet, but we've had no evidence for oil seeps being of permatrasic age, but that doesn't rule it out, and I'd like to think it could be down there, but there's been no exploration so far of the, specifically on those permatrasic um, sub-basins. All right, you better. Thank you very much, Mike.